So we asked uh, or hunted around for a speaker on the topic of uh, uh, Asian giant hornets and uh, who should pop up but the uh, state of, of uh, Washington uh, who has an official representative to uh, uh, inform us about uh, Asian giant hornets. And this is Cassie. If you want to tell us any more of your history, go, go ahead. Otherwise, you can dive in. That's good enough for me. Um, other than, yeah, I'm just an outreach specialist for the Department of Agriculture in Washington. And I mean, obviously, honeybees affect agriculture. And now we have a predator of honeybees. So that's why I'm here to tell you about that. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen in a second. Throughout my presentation, we'll stop and chat. Um, you guys feel free to unmute yourselves and ask any questions you have. Um, so you're going to see your faces for a brief second while my PowerPoint kicks in. Okay. <clears throat> oh, sorry. So obviously, um, can someone just confirm for me that you see one screen and not duplicate slides? We're good. All right, so obviously we're gonna talk about Asian giant hornet. Um, we over, you know, call it Vespa mandarinia. Uh, it has other nicknames like yak killer hornet, giant sparrow bee, etc. And then of course we all know the infamous murder hornet. Just brief background on how the term came to mind is the New York Times, right? When Asian giant hornet was first discovered um, in the Pacific Northwest in Washington state, they published an article titled Asian giant hornet threatens honeybees in the Pacific Northwest. And it gained some ground, gained some action, gained some traction. So then they talked to some researchers overseas, followed the WSDA as we spent experimental lures, and then May they used that title murder hornets. People were a little bit bored during the pandemic looking for something to do. It got sensationalized, caught traction and ran. Silver lining is now people care about keeping the honeybee safe as well as I can now tell people that they're not murder hornets because they murder people, but they can murder our honeybees. So um, a couple things I'll go over. Again, uh, we can stop and chat, but basically the Asian giant hornet is the largest hornet in the world. Um, they're we're always going to be between that inch and a half to two inches, give or take a little bit. Um, there's no such thing as a baby Asian giant hornet. So when they emerge, they're their full adult size, right? The way you're going to tell these apart from different insects, um, and I will show you a couple of these side by side at the end, is it has that very large orange yellow prominent head. That's why I have that red circle there for you so we can't forget. It's its most distinguishing feature. It's basically like if you were to imagine like a pumpkin on your head, its head is as big and as wide as its body from like shoulder to shoulder. So that's very distinct. Um, and then it has pretty much orange and yellow banding on its abdomen um, and it's pretty consistent. So they're obviously native to Asia, hence their name. And they like subtropic to moderate temperatures. So that's why the climate of the Pacific Northwest um, is pretty substantial. Um, they're typically found in forested areas and they're in their native range. When they were first found here, right, um, was December 2019 in Blaine, Washington. So that's the very northwest corner for furthest northwest county in Washington state. Um, if you didn't know before that, though, in September 2019, over in Nanaimo, British Columbia, so that's over on Vancouver Island, they did actually, the beekeepers over there removed an Asian giant hornet nest previously that September. So obviously, why do we not want them here? Because they threaten our honeybees, human health and agriculture. Okay, um, I'm gonna show you this map here and then um, I'm gonna detail those threats for you. So if you have any questions about um, anything we've talked about so far after I talk about this map, that'd be a good time. So this is basically just a climatic study and I'll go ahead and post this link in the chat box for you, as well as I think I have about four other studies now um, that kind of are just talking about the spread of the Asian giant hornet. So this is based solely on climatic factors like weather patterns, right? If you see the areas of red to yellow, that's you know pretty suitable for Asian giant hornet. That blue swampy color to the purple really isn't that best. So you see, right, the Pacific Northwest is great, but then as you move from the West Coast to the East Coast, there's a big chunk of uh, area there that isn't exactly suitable for Asian giant hornet to survive. So that kind of tells us that 
you know, it'd be hard for it to spread itself from the West Coast to the East Coast. It would need some help. It would need to hitchhike, et cetera. But we do know that it got itself here from Asia and invasive species are really good at things like that. Um, so we don't want to completely knock that out. Do you have, do you guys have any questions or anything before I move on? I'm going to talk about kind of its nest and biology next. Um, my personal guess is that hitchhiking on cargo in uh, truck trailers or rail cars is probably one of the big uh, possibilities. Yeah, my, I think my computer's frozen. Sorry. Uh, yeah, so obviously it's, we're always, I'm always going to say it's speculation um, because we didn't see it happen, but that's probably the best, one of the best guesses. And then one thing I'll talk about later is in its native range, it's some of the pupae and the larvae is considered a delicacy. Um, so they may have been brought over for a food source, but a little bit, little couple things would have to happen for that. So it could have deliberately been brought over as well. That's really illegal. So I don't suggest you do it. <laughs> All right, Let's see if I can get this rolling. Okay, so um, I said, obviously, we don't want to hear for a couple of reasons. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, kind of go over its biology and a couple of things about it. Um, one, because it's in regard to human health. Two, it'll help you understand why we do what we do at certain times of the year in efforts to keep this pest from establishing. So in the hornet's native range, right, what they observe, what research tells us is that these are ground nesters. What they do is they find the base of kind of like a rotted out tree where there would be a hollow, kind of a cavity. They would um, begin to build their nest in there. They can actually even excavate that further. Um, so in the ground, they can make these nests that are over two feet wide, have multiple combs, and literally produce hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of adult hornets, okay? <coughs> Now, this is the first time the hornets are outside of their native range. So over in Blaine, Washington, or over in Whatcom County, we have actually been finding them in all their snacks. So in, in the case, in dead alder trees inside a tree cavity. So this picture I have here for you, you can see this nest is multiple cones. And that would be, you can see it's kind of been restricted in growth and how it's had to grow inside that tree cavity. If you're ever looking at pictures of the nest combs from Asia, they're usually super, super wide and super, super round. I can't really tell you if that's where they're going to continue to nest because this is the first time they're outside of their native range and there just isn't enough data, not enough rhyme or reason to guess yet. So here's a video of the first nest this year. You can see the hornets um, coming and leaving the nest. What they're doing is some of them are coming out um, as they're excavating. Um, some are going back into the nest with food balls. So throughout their life, what they do is they go out, they fly and forage, find insects, mash them up into balls and take them back to feed their young. So that's kind of what they're doing here. This first nest of the year, we thought, oh, this is going to be one of those typical nests because it's very, the activity seems like what we read in research papers and see um, in videos overseas, as well as it looked like they were entering at the ground. However, they did continue to go up into that dead snag um, basically from the root of the tree. The other thing that I want you to know about um, the nest is Asian giant hornets are typically non-aggressive unless they feel threatened, right? They're called an apex predator, meaning they're top of the food chain. So they can kind of do what they want. They don't really care about us. Um, but if you happen to come upon an Asian giant hornet nest, that's when they're gonna feel threatened. So they're going to try to protect their nest. So your chances of getting stung are real then. Typically what they do is they exit the nest and swarm you. Um, in their native range, 10 to 20 people die each year, um, but that's because they're actually trying to excavate the nest. However, some years upwards of 40 people do die because there are workers out in a field that accidentally stumble upon one. Do you have any questions about anything to do with the nest? All right. So the next thing I want to talk about um, is kind of the life cycle of the Asian giant hornet. I'm going to spend a minute on this graphic, starting in the top and moving in a clockwise position. So in winter, right, the males and the workers are dead, as well as the original founding queen. 
I hear a little bit of feedback, so if someone just joined, you might want to mute yourself. Oh, that was easy peasy. The only thing that makes it through the winter is the new queens. And what they'll do is they will overwinter, meaning they will dig themselves into some soil um, or find a sheltered spot. And then what comes out, what season comes after winter, y'all? Spring. spring. Right. So in the spring, those queens will emerge and they will find a place to build their underground nest. Okay. <clears throat> the chances of seeing a queen, right, is going to be a little bit lower because the population is lower. Right, so then she will, once she has that nest started, she's gonna start laying those workers so those workers can go out, find food to help the nest expand even more. What that, what's that season after spring? Summer, so that summer season is when we're gonna start seeing those workers because that population is gonna be up there. There's enough to be flying around, enough for us to see. Um, like I said, they're gonna fly around. When they forage, they'll eat. Bees, beetles, wasps, dragonflies, butterflies, <coughs> moss. They'll eat individual insects, take them back to feed their young. And they'll do that all throughout the summer and into the, into the next season. What's the next season after summer? Fall or autumn. And this is the season that we want to pay the most attention to the Asian giant hornets for two reasons, right? So that colony has reached its maturity meaning it's up to size or the queen is just in her mature life. So now she is done laying workers and she is going to switch over to laying new virgin queens and males, right? Obviously we wanna pay attention to the nest once the queens start coming out. But the other reason we pay attention um, is because the new queens and males are a lot bigger than those workers. And because of their sheer size, the colony might need a little bit more food in their diet at this time. <coughs> and what is that good one-stop shop source for a lot of food? Your honeybees, right? So we're in the fall time, right? We have the new queens and the males, so we need that food, so we're going after the honeybees. The other thing is happening is those queens and males, they are going to emerge from that nest. They mate really, really close to the nest. Then the queens will fly off to overwinter. And the males and the workers, again, they will die, as well as that founding queen. So one nest, one year, right? A couple things. Fortunately, not all queens will make it through the winter. Unfortunately, I don't know the dispersal distance of a queen. So I don't know after the queen mates how far she can fly up or after she overwinters how far she can fly up again. Um, so that research just isn't there. There's only about two research papers on Asian giant hornet coming out. <clears throat> and they all come from the 70s. It kind of be like us studying a lot about yellow jackets over here, right? We live with them. Um, so that's kind of the difference. The last thing I'm going to talk about um, is about that. Uh, well, I guess I'll talk about two more slides or I'll talk about one more slide. I'll pause after this slide. So I was talking about that fall time, right? And that's when the honeybees are in the danger zone. And being beekeepers, I'm sure you've already read about this and know how it happens. But if you haven't, right, what happens is the Asian giant hornet, the worker, it'll go find a honey beehive and it'll mark it with a pheromone. And then later on, if that colony decides that they need the protein source, they will go back to that hive, right? That signal, that pheromone will help let the other hornets know, hey, come here. The honeybees, they fly out to protect their hive. And then the Asian giant hornets grab them, systematically chop off, decapitate every single honeybee's heads, dropping their bodies, right? So you see all these dead honeybee carcasses outside of your hive, because what they want is actually inside their hive. Think about it. What are your honeybees getting ready to do right now, right? Getting ready for the winter. There is some really nice, fat, juicy bread and pupae in there. So then the Asian giant hornets will enter the hive, Right, this is called the occupation phase. When they're chopping off their heads is the slaughter phase, okay? They're going to harvest the brood and the pupae until it's all gone, it's no longer viable, or they just don't want it anymore. Now this, remember, this is going to happen in the fall, and it doesn't always happen, but it can. Um, typically, they're gonna stick in that first phase is the hunting phase, where they're just gonna kind of grab one individual bee and take it back. All right, I'm going to throw some, num some numbers your way, and I want you to guess and think about time. 
So on average, if I have like one to 20 Asian giant hornets, how long do you think it'll take them to wipe out one nice, strong apiary? Like 45 to 65,000 bees. <coughs> on average, it takes them about 90 minutes. Um, the other thing as being beekeepers, once the hornets decide they want your hive, it is their hive. It is not yours anymore. Um, so meaning if beekeepers were to come up uh, upon the hornets while they were decapitating the bees or feasting off the bread and the pupae, sometimes even hunting, um, your chances of getting stung are definitely there. And your normal beekeeping attire will not keep you safe from the almost quarter inch stinger of the Asian giant hornet. So I'm gonna talk about this one and then it's a great place to stop. Um, so then typically people ask me, well, how do they have honeybees in their native range if Asian giant hornets, you know, are so nasty? Well, a couple differences is over here. I mean, you guys, typically up where I am, we have European honeybees. Um, overseas, there are Japanese honeybees, okay? Um, a couple different things is European honeybees, right? Great producers of honey. Japanese honeybees, not so great producers of honey, but they do have a slight defense mechanism against the Asian giant hornet. So what happens is if the hornet attempts to mark the hive with the pheromone, the honeybees will fly out and create a bee ball around the hornet and they'll kind of buzz and warm their body temperatures up just enough to essentially cook that hornet alive. It drops and dies. So if they're able to do this before it marks the hive with the pheromone, they can protect their hive. Um, now, unfortunately, sometimes they do lose like 30% of their hive. <clears throat> they can do, um, lose about 30% of their um, apiary in doing this, um, but all in all, they're able to protect them from getting demolished. Um, the other thing is, uh, I, have one, I have one more point of this. Oh, you guys are beekeepers, right? Do y'all love mites? You want more mites here, don't you? You want me to bring some tropa lalax mites over? Because I can if we bring these Japanese honeybees over here. So no, no, please keep the tropa lalax out of this, the U.S. <laughs> All right. All right. So um, do you all have any questions, comments, concerns? Do you want to yell at me? Feel free. Honeybees can get through a, um, a screen that's about a quarter inch mesh. Uh, would that be sufficient to keep the uh, Asian giant hornets out of the hives? So in, <clears throat> in their native range, um, some of the, okay, so they do use like reducers, like what you're talking about. Um, their kind of reducers are typically a little bit different instead of just a screen. Um, it's actually usually a, the hornets can still, they have to kind of, the hornets can still kind of get in, but usually then they have kind of a cone or something. So the hornet can actually get away. Their hives are sometimes in certain areas, actually only one box and the boxes will kind of be placed around each other. So instead of using losing all their boxes, they'll lose one, um, but they do use entrances and reducers. The thing is, is did I just say that? Anyway, um, the thing is if the hornets want to get in, they will eventually get in and they will find a way to get in. Um, so, I mean, I'm sure you find that out with yellow jackets sometimes, but yeah, that's, that's something that they do over there. More often than not though, in the fall time, kind of what it comes down to is standing outside your hive with a tennis racket 24 seven and just <laughs> whacking them as they come by. <laughs> how many, how many um, stings would it take to uh, actually kill an uh, average human being so everyone I, it's it's gonna depend on how you react to stings so the reason here i'll show you a picture of the reason an insect sting hurts is because here's a good here's i'll let you look at something oh just kidding my face will go away anyway the reason an insect sting hurts is because basically the size of the insect so if you look at, here's a Asian giant hornet and a honeybee, um, the size of the insect means the size of the venom it's able to carry in its body kind of. So an Asian giant hornet obviously is a lot larger than the, our normal stinging insects. Um, the other thing that happens is since it's a hornet, it can sting multiple times. Um, mm. And it actually causes a, oh gosh, my mind is not in my head today. Um, 
not cirrhosis. Uh, it will kill, it will kill the skin surrounding the sting site. Um, so it's just going to depend on if you have a bad reaction to it. Typically when you're stung multiple times though, you will be going to see um, a healthcare provider, doctor, et cetera. And then you had said that it takes um, 90 minutes to decimate an apiary. I'm guessing you mean like one hive, right? So 90 minutes yep. for a hive, not like 90 minutes and five hives are wiped out. No. Okay. It's, yeah. And that's just kind of, that's just an average number um, in, from their native range. They say one to 20 hornets, typically, you know, five, six, seven, about 90 minutes to do like 45 to 65,000. They and then what and the range is like so so they they travel how far from their nest for for food um we'll talk about that it's about five or eight kilometers which is around five miles so they've got a pretty big range then wow i mean like any insect they're gonna be kind of they're gonna definitely be opportunistic um well i shouldn't say definitely but that's kind of what we are some stuff that we're working on right now, um, but you know, do they have they eat whatever easiest? <laughs> uh, do they have bee suits that would protect you from this thing? Yeah, I'll have. If you've ever seen those white, not bee suits, um, they are. You can find them on Amazon. I'll show you a couple pictures of me in them. They're those. They're just this thick nylon mesh. Um, you can't really, it's very hard to see in it, maneuver in it, but it will keep you safe from a sting. Basically there's a, it's foam that's just longer than that, than the stinger and it's kind of encased in this nylon mesh, the gloves, the boots, everything's kind of one piece, um, over your face, there is like mesh to breathe out of, but then over that, you will put a clear plastic face shield over it because they can secrete venom. And if that gets into your eyes, um, it can be damaging as well. And then they got those mandibles that can chew and bite as well. Okay. We don't want these guys. <laughs> just a horrible no. creature. <laughs> um, I'm going to hop in, right? And I'm going to talk about um, kind of one last thing about them in their native range. And then I'm going to kind of switch gears and talk about what we're doing here in Washington. Um, so we'll pause and do questions throughout that. And once I'm done telling you all about what y'all do, um, I'll talk about some of the other insects that we see that look like them. Okay. I apologize for seeing your face for one second. Okay. Oh, um, okay, we're working out now. So in their native range, the larvae, the pupae, is considered a delicacy, okay? Remember I said if you go up to an Asian giant hornet nest, they want to swarm you, they want to sting you they want to protect their home so people will actually try to locate these nests to excavate them to find this delicacy it's about 33 dollars a pound the last time i checked okay so the uh, fry it up have a large feast it's awesome um in there in over there um, a couple other things they do with the hornet is they put it in energy drinks um, you will see some of their athletes using it people that are preparing for the Olympics, et cetera. Um, it's supposed to make them be better athletes. Uh, they'll also put the hornets in the alcohol, kind of like people will do the tequila and the worm as a novelty as well. So that is the other part of the speculation of maybe they got here, a mated queen came over because remember we need a mated queen to successfully make a nest and not all queens successfully mate. So if a mated queen did get over here some way, somehow by freight or this way and started a nest, that might be another reason. All right, so what have we been finding? So this is a very, very, very zoomed in map um, of Washington, right? This is about, I would say nine miles wide and four miles north and south. So this is, if you think about the size of that, that's the very, very northwest corner of Washington. Um, is that zoomed in map on the left and we have had 14 total detections this year and we've removed three nests 
Now, if you looked at the picture on the right, that's a, zoom, a more zoomed out picture of the northwest corner of Washington. From the first red dot to the last red dot, it's about an hour, hour and a half drive south. Another Asian giant hornet was found this May two counties south. Now, this was a deceased male found in the spring. If you recall in the life cycle, do you remember what season the males come out? Oh. It, yep, it's typically in the fall. So we found a carcass of a male in the spring, meaning that carcass would have like had, likely had to have been on the ground throughout the fall, throughout the winter, and into the spring when we found it. I'm just going to tell you that a dead insect doesn't make it that far on the ground that long. Other insects eat it, rain and snow get to it, um, other animals will eat it. So it might have been more likely that this um, hornet, which is you can see the picture on the right is the actual carcass, um, maybe fell out of something that was getting unboxed or unpackaged, um, or maybe with one of the, maybe with some um, um, shipment of some plants that were being unboxed. The other thing that made this unique is it is actually a separate introduction from the other hornets we're finding. If you remember, one queen starts the nest and then kind of makes them all. So we can analyze in simpler terms kind of their DNA, DNA barcode. And if they're alike, it's going to kind of state they're from the same source introduction. If they're not, they're going to be different. Um, the other thing you can see here is the color differentiation is a little bit different. Actually, the hornets in their native range, depending on if they're coming from like Asia, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, sometimes they will vary a little bit in their segmented color. All right, last year we had one nest removed, this year we've had three, okay? Now what happens is once we have one of those red dots, right, or a detection of an Asian giant hornet, what we do is we create what I call a response grid. So this is a picture of all of our detections from last year any red circle or diamond you can see. And this is where that eight kilometers, that traveling distance you were asking about comes in handy. So we take the spot of where we found the Asian giant hornet and then go out eight kilometers in every direction and draw a circumference around that, right? Because that's gonna tell us, well, how far it was likely to travel um, from there. After that, we just kind of overlay a grid pattern because that tells us how many traps to place and where. Um, each year we place um, about eight to 900 traps um, until we have de a detection of a hornet. Then we kind of spring into action and place another 50 traps um, right within the density of the, where that area was to try and catch a hornet. Beca but the unique thing about um, the state of Washington here is it's not just us trapping. We actually reached out to the citizens of Washington and said, if you are able to and you have the time and the resources and can commit to any amount to help us become a citizen scientist and help us trap for Asian giant hornets. And people in Washington actually responded amazingly. Last year, they placed about four, or over 1,200 traps. And this year, they placed um, almost 800. So it's really this kind of joint effort between us and the public to um, make sure we're covering as much ground as possible. What the traps we're using is going to what you see is that picture on the left. So it's a clear plastic bottle and it's a mixture of rice cooking wine and orange juice. And this is actually one of the traps that they use over in its native range that seems to work pretty well. Um, we do experiment with lots of other lures and things throughout the season as well as we just sent a bunch over to Japan. Um, but this kind of seems to be what is working the best. So the idea is the hornet flies by. It smells that scent of that bait then it is lured into the trap, drowns, and dies. So y'all think I can do much with a dead hornet? So what is my program doing? I'm drowning hornets. Well, we tell people to track them, don't whack them, so that's exactly what we're going to do. It's okay if we trap an Asian giant hornet in one of our bottle traps because our eyeballs can't look 24-7. But essentially what that bottle trap is, is it is our eye, it is a pair of eyeballs looking 24 seven. So once we have um, a report of an Asian giant hornet that we're able to confirm by picture or one caught in our trap, we spring into action, like I said, placing lots and lots and lots of live traps around it. So they're essentially modif modified bo bottle traps or bucket traps. The hornet can um, fly in, it just doesn't drown and die. It still gets stuck in the trap. 
Um, these traps get checked a lot more frequently um, due to the hornet might overheat in there. But eventually, by citizens reporting or trapping, we're going to have a live Asian giant hornet. Do y'all know what we do next? What should we do? What? Tag it. <laughs> yeah, I actually want to keep this alive. Um, any dead hornet, right, is great for detection. But if I have the live hornet, I want to use it to find the nest because if I can remove that entire nest, I am removing any population from coming forward. So what I'm actually going to do or we're going to do is we're going to tag it and then release it. By nature, this hornet, she is going to want to go home, right? So if she has her radio tag transmitter on her and she flies off back to um, her nest, we can hopefully follow the signal to locate the nest. Um, it's a little bit more complicated than it looks. We're basically, it uses the process of telemetry. So tromping around the forest with an old cable TV antenna, listening for a signal, but we have got really good with it. The last one, it took us about an hour to locate the last nest. So once we get close to that nest, right? We don't want to accidentally stumble upon it. So once the signal is strong enough, we're looking for evidence of hornets coming and going, right? And here you can see an Asian giant hornet actually entering a tree cavity. Once we have that nest located, what should we do? Kill them. Yep, we want to remove it, eradicate it. So each scenario is going to be different, right? All of our eradications that we practice, we practice for them being in the ground, um, which would mean, right, um, you would come up to the hornet's nest in the ground, cap off the entrance, suck out any live hornets, and then just dig and excavate that nest up. Um, unfortunately, or I guess I should say either way, we've been finding nests inside tree cavities. So kind of the same process of getting to the nest um, plugging up their entrance hole um, and then vacuuming out as many adult hornets as you can. Basically, what we did was we essentially modified a shock vac um, into this to have this big plastic container. So you see here, um, it does suck the hornets out and then they get stuck in that container. Most of those hornets actually come out, come out live. And those are the hornets that we actually send off um, to APHIS. Um, for testing to find a better lure or a best possible lure to put in those bottle traps, right? We've had to get excavators, but eventually we get those nests down. We can open them and remove the hornets. That's kind of it. I'm going to tell you about what you, we should do. We've already kind of talked about the stings of an Asian giant hornet, so I don't want to go ahead and blab at you again. Um, I'm going to go ahead and move into talking about some kind of lookalikes, but if we have some questions or comments or anything before I get going, now's a great time. Yeah, I've, I've dug up yellow jacket nests that have been more than two feet wide. And so you're saying that these giant hornet nests are, are limited to about two feet? No, um, they'll produce like hundreds, so hundreds and possibly even thousands of hornets. Um, they are typically ground nesters. So if they are in the ground, their um, colonies, you know, they can expand and make them as wide as they want in the dirt. The ones we've been finding though are in the tree cavities. So they're, they can only go up and down in the cavity. So their combs aren't going to be as wide. Um, their combs are like, you could fit your like thumb in their big combs because the hornets are bigger too. So. A hundred combs takes up more than a, a yellow jacket, if that makes sense. And do they have multiple laying queens in a nest, or are they just one queen per nest? Just one queen per nest, and she will lay all of the new virgin queens for next year, as well as the males. They'll mate and then disperse. Okay, thank you. Um, you have... Um most of the targets that you've identified up in the Northwest, Pacific Northwest, um, what's the likelihood uh, or timetable, if there is, that we'll have them in the Bay Area? Or is there some reason why you probably never see them here because of temperature, climate, et cetera? Um, so here, I wanna, I'm gonna post a couple studies in the chat box. Um, it, so it's kind of like not 
subtropic to moderate enough as what I've seen from maps, but I haven't dug into them too much. Um, this is the first time they've been anywhere but Asia, so I would definitely not count it out. But I would also hope that we're getting good enough at doing this that we stop them here. Um, and then the other thing is, I just don't know how far the queens can fly. So I don't know how far they can spread themselves or how much people might aid and abet them or if they're going to come back over from Asia again in 20 year ports. Okay. And your eradication efforts, um, how, what, what's your success rate? Like all of the red dots, are you able to say that all those red dots are gone or there's more or they're just, the pace is just running away from you? So last year we found one nest, this year we found three. All of the detections that we had um, were within three miles of the nests we removed. So it's likely that any detection we had um, came from a nest that was removed. We didn't have any outside of kind of like a three, maybe three and a half mile range um, as kind of like a crow would fly. So unfortunately, I just don't know how many nests there could have been out there. So I don't know if we missed one, but all of them seem to be within the same detection range this year. Okay, thank you. Paul, I had a question about um, breeding. Um, so the queen breeds with, uh, I mean, how, they breed with their own uh, males? So, um, the, okay, so in the fall, the virgin queens and the males will emerge from the nest and mate. Then with if those other. queens success, then if those queens had successfully mated in the spring, they'll build their own nest. Does that make so sense? The, so they're then, breeding so, with their own, with their own. So mm -hmm. their yep. So that mated queen that starts her nest in the spring come fall time will be popping out more males and queens. If the queen successfully mate, they can move on to um, do that again. Um, it's really kind of unknown if that would create kind of a bottleneck feature to keep our populations low or not, because that's what they do in their native range. That's really interesting because um, assuming there was just one queen that started this whole mess in 2019, then all of the queens, all of the hives that we're seeing today are the descendant of that founder queen. If the virgin queens mate with their brothers, then, and they're all the, you know, F1 generation, as it were, of, of, the, of the, 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 the hives queen, this, this is going to be a pretty inbred population before long. Um, is there very, is, is there, do we know anything about the mutation rate? I mean, how, where are they getting the genetic variation? Nope, that hasn't been studied enough and there actually isn't that much of their gene or DNA mapping to kind of trace it back to place of origin to see if uh, maybe there m might be a little bit of variation. Um, basically what we can tell now from the maps we have and what we're getting at is that they're coming from the same, the same introduction. Um, it's just each nest will literally produce hundreds of queens um, so the chances of those queens moving forth is, I come, it breaks down to like 30 and then something percent again. So it comes out to be about in its native range, about 15% that will actually successfully mate and start a nest. But if we have like 300 queens, 15%, that number is still really big. Yeah. Um, and I just, that bottleneck I don't, or that inbreeding is just kind of honestly unknown. Um, honeybees, of course, uh, a honeybee queen will mate with a whole variety of males and will carry the sperm from many males. And so the offspring of that bee will, they'll be half sisters. And, and uh, is that the same thing with, with the hornet? Do they, do, does a queen male mate with more than one male or is one and done? Um, I believe it's one and done because the males, that's their only job. Yeah, but that well, doesn't mean, true for and then they say sayonara. Yep. Yeah, no, so I'm the sorry. one queen to the one male is what I read. Then that's that's really um, that's really an inbred population. Okay, this this is this is fun genetics. Thank you. All right, friends, let's look at some imposters and then any other questions are definitely welcome. Okay, so, oh, I should probably start my slideshow so you don't have to look at your faces. 
All right, here's our European honeybees. This is a side-by-side -side size comparison. Um, people are whacking our bumblebees left and right, especially in the spring. Um, so basically tell everybody, if it's hairy, it's not a hornet, right? Our bumblebees are pretty, are small, black, yellow, fuzzy. Um, a lot of people will hear them buzzing, especially, you know, the queens in the spring, they'll get scared and whack them. So to help spread the knowledge to leave our little bumblebees alone. <laughs> um, something that you might see are cicada killers. Um, there is the difference between the one on the left and the one on the right being um, Western and Eastern cicada killers. We're over here on the West, so we're gonna focus on the left one. Um, they can get up to two inches long. Um, so that is kind of the reason people tend to freak out when they see them. Um, but do you remember what I said was the most distinguishing feature of the Asian giant hornet? It was in a red circle at the very beginning. The orange head. Yep, the size proportion of that head. So if you look at both of the cicada killers, their head is just not as big and as wide as its body, right? That's gonna tell you not an Asian giant hornet. The other thing too, the thorax of them tend to be more red where the Asian giant hornet is black. Um, you can't tell in this picture, but they have round eyes. And then um, lastly, you can see that the banding is different on the abdomen. Um, Asian giant hornets tend to be more uniform where the cicada killers have that, like the teardrop effect where you see it dropping down. Excuse me. Here's one of your favorites, bald face hornets found throughout North America, half an inch to three quarters of an inch. These are the ones that are black and white, okay? So we all know the queens can get bigger, but black and white, it's an Asian giant hornet. This is one I see a lot of people reporting kind of like late in the summer when the summer really starts to kick in. They're called great golden digger wasps, pretty much found throughout all of North America. They're about an inch long and they do have that wasp waist that you can see it's very narrow and long. Also, you notice those are the bright bomb diggity down colors of kind of that orangey yellow and black. But see those legs are orange where Asian giant hornets aren't. And then that abdomen is different. We have the right colors, but it has that um, black with solid orange red towards the front end. So it's missing that banding. Um, I'm gonna, this one we don't have here in the Western United States, but it's a European hornet. Um, you'll see it in, or sorry, we don't, so yes. <laughs> um, it's found in the Eastern United States and they can get up to two inches long. This is the closest thing um, to an Asian giant hornet that's been being found um, in the United States, but we don't have it on our side and hopefully we can keep it out. I have three more for you. Um, this is probably, you know, the next one's gonna be your favorite. So these are horntail wasps and the reason people um, get scared when you see these is on the end of it, that looks like a really big stinger. Well, it's actually not, it's an ovipositor, which is an egg laying tube. And this is how they get their nickname is wood wasp because they use that to lay their eggs in wood. Almost all of them that you see are the native ones and they're pretty beneficial. Um, so they're harmless and they, they just fly around. <laughs> Here's your favorite. I can tell you all about yellow jackets and how they're different and how they're about half an inch long unless they're the queen, but I think you know enough. Second to last one for you are soft flies. They're found throughout North America, three quarters to an inch long. Um, they don't have that wasp waist. Instead, they have that whiter yellow spot on its thorax. Um, they, their wings are a little bit longer than its body, so sometimes its size looks really, really big. Um, fun fact that this is the largest soft fly on the continent. People will start seeing these super early in the spring as they emerge in this adult form. Um, the last thing that you can use to tell the Asian giant hornet apart from other insects is if you look at that antennae, this has a club on the end where Asian giant hornet does not. Last one are paper wasps because they're found throughout North America, three quarters of an inch long. You can usually tell these apart um, because they have that distinct, well-defined wasp waist. However, you know, if you ever think you see one, I want you to go ahead and report it. Obviously you aren't in Washington, so don't let me know because I don't have any jurisdiction down there. So you would need to let your department of ag, or if you have like a local extension office, or if you have some master gardeners, let them know. Um, everyone's gonna want to have a photo if possible. So just if you're outside, 
carry your phone around with you. I wouldn't get too carried away because you're not in Whatcom County of Washington yet. But if you ever see a dead insect laying on the ground, you can always pick it up and turn it in. This goes basically with any time you see a bug that looks like it's out of place or just kind of weird or you want to know what it is. You can you just take a picture and report it to your Department of Agriculture and they'll usually figure it out for you. Last thing is um, just a couple ways to connect and blab at me. My email's down there at the bottom. We have a YouTube page that has, I think, about 26 different videos on it right now. Um, they're all, a couple of them are press conferences from the past, but there's some videos of us at the nest. You can watch some nest activity of the hornets coming and going, as well as a recap from last year. The last thing is the very thing at the top is if you are into social media, especially Facebook, there is a group, Asian Giant Hornet Watch, ran by us. People get on there and chat. Um, they see what's going on in the hornet world as well as that's where I publish some of the updates. So with that being said, last slide here for you. And then if you have any other questions, um, I'm gonna go ahead and turn my camera on and get off this share world. So what about um, across the border in British Columbia? Are they in a panic up there too? Um, so they haven't had any confirmed sightings this year, um, but they do work with us and we work with them. We have like monthly meetings where we kind of just chat, see if anything's going on on either sides. Um, actually, I lied. They did just have one um, discovered. So it was right due north of the first nest that we removed this year. And it was actually a deceased hornet found in a Japanese beetle trap that hadn't been checked for about a month. Um, the It was pretty uh, beaten up. You know, I'd been sitting in a trap full of some other insects for quite a while. Um, so the last thing that, this was about two or three weeks ago, um, the entomologists there were going to try and grab a leg and see if they could get some DNA off of it to see if it was um, the same introduction as that nest that we removed here. Um, unfortunately, it was pretty beaten up, so I don't believe they were able to get anything off of it. Um, in the fall time, the last year and this year, they switched over to trying some protein-based traps using like cat food, um some bacon and this year i think some fish oil to try and see if maybe that would lure the asian giant hornets um but really it just got in a bunch of critters um yeah they ask people to report they do the same thing about same thing as us but just didn't have any reports this year other than that one i have a question what is the comb made out of and what is the white capping They essentially just kind of rub and chew that off. The nest, if you've ever found a bald-faced hornet nest and like flipped it over, right, you see kind of the spit up, chewed up wood and different stuff that they use to make that. That's basically what the Asian giant hornet nest resembles as well. Thanks. Sorry, Mike. Say hi to my kitty. <laughs> Brian! <laughs> That's okay. We're big on cats around here. Usually Jerry has his on the meeting as well. She was just trying to show off. <laughs> How much do you guys know about the uh, uh, about the uh, the life? I mean, the whole life thing because it seems kind of strange that you would have these queens mate and then they fly off and then they all of a sudden start having a colony. I mean seems like a really difficult life because they'd have to do they pull some they must pull some other bees with them when they fly away yeah huh? um when the so there's like i said there's unfortunately only two studies on them coming out of from the 70s um you know they just kind of live they're a native species over there so they're not like studied as much it'd be like us studying the crap out of us in yellow jackets um Typically when the queens emerge, the literature says that they actually feed on tree sap. Um, the other thing I didn't mention is the adult Asian giant hornets cannot actually consume solids. So they actually have to, they bring back the kind of the bald ball of protein, ball of food. They feed it to their young who kind of regurgitate it to eat themselves. 
So that would be the other thing is um, the idea of our, the tree sap kind of where we have at our time of the year may not be flowing as well as over in Asia. So that could be a limiting food factor too, or maybe there's something else going on. Um, it'd be awesome to research it, but we just want to get rid of them. Uh, Unless, it, it doesn't seem like you know, tree sap's going to have a whole lot of protein in it. So, I mean, you know, like she's got to eat something to, uh, or the colony has got to eat something to, to make the, to bring the brood out. But anyway, you've got a really interesting job because the harder you work, the harder you're going to have to work. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, um, I, I think she's she... trying to work her way out of a job. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like what the best your, the best solution is to not have a job. I don't know about that one. You know, <laughs> well, this, I mean, yeah. there's other there's other bugs and issues, and the world just continues to lose their minds over Asian giant hornets, but. <laughs> as long as we're protecting our, protecting our pollinators, because that's the other thing is I don't know how the hornets are going to impact some of our other pollinators um, and things like that. So, so for, for each year that uh, you have giant hornets, obviously you're going to have to continue trapping for the succeeding year. If you have a year where you don't trap any, how many more years do you continue the program um, making mm -hmm. sure that you didn't miss any? Um, it's is the, drop the, the feds, so as federal language, it's multiple, and uh, that usually doubts three years. So it has, yeah. No so detections for three one years. Year with none, and then multiple would be two after that. So basically three years and none total. Um, the other thing back to the last mention of the nest, I just wanted to like note that when the queen starts the nest, she only she she'll start like with a really small comb and dropping like five eggs, and then those will larvae, and then the workers will kind of do the work after that, and she'll just do only her business of popping out eggs. So I had a question anyway, about how, how um, like the queen honeybee, she can't feed herself, she can't do much for herself. So does the queen hornet um, she able to? Uh, eat her own food and take care of herself. So they can, they can, they like, like sweet sugary things as more of the, as, but it comes through more of a form as like a quick, like energy source. So they can stop and feed on like tree sap, or that's why we have the bottle traps out because as they're hunting and feeding, um, it will give them a little bit of energy to find the actual protein food source to bring it back, um, to have them regurgitate it for like more of a substantial kind of like meal. Um, the other thing, it's just kind of more of a quick burst of energy, if that makes sense. Like, think about us eating a candy bar versus a meal. So that's the queen, not the, the workers. I'm sorry, bro you broke up or I broke up? So I, so I was wondering, can the queen feed her? You're saying the queen can feed herself, right? I, the research says that she can feed on tree sap um, once that, she emerges in the spring. Right. So when she emerges, but once in the, the spring, workers are out, they're going to be finding the insects to bring back. And that, then that's going to be their primary food source is the regurgitation from the workers. And that's the, or from the regurgitation from the larvae. And yeah, the, the larvae regurgitates a, a liquid, which feeds the workers and the queen. Okay. Um, but once the queen starts building the nest, does she go out to forage at all or does she just wait she's until pretty much solid she's pretty much solitary after that. She's pretty much she's going to be inside the nest. Mm -hmm. She does, I know I know that there are some ants that have a very similar system where um, there's a solitary queen that overwinters or has a you know period of time where she's all alone, goes out, um, uh, flies off, uh, finds a suitable place, digs a hole, builds a nest, lays her eggs, and loses her wings and literally cannot go out of the, out of the hive to forage. The, but the mother, um, the queen of a hive of, of uh, Asian hornets, they, 
they just die the next year, right? I mean, they don't um, they don't continue on. Correct. Yeah. The one that. So the earliest uh, detection this year or so far has been sometime in August for adults? Um, this year, gosh, June, what, June, it's June July, up. August. Well, yep, I think this year was August is number eight. Yes, so this year was August. Last year, we did have someone define a dead deceased queen, I believe in May. Hmm. But that's probably one that overwintered and didn't, uh, you know, did not successfully start her own hive. Yeah, without going back and exactly looking, I can't recall if she was um, mated or unmated. Mm -hmm. So okay. I'm gonna post a link in the chat box. So all what I do is I write these things called um, Hornet Herald or stakeholder updates. And you can go on this page here and drop down the first drop down menu and it has um, Hornet Herald stakeholder update. I try to do about one every month and it just gives an update of everything that's going on in the Hornet world and I they get emailed out um, in a PDF, PDF or HTML to your email kind of automatically so you can go on that page and read the past ones. And then if you want those emails, oh man, to automatically come to your inbox, you can shoot me an email and I'll go ahead and add you to my list. Or you can click this other link that I'm posting in the chat box. The first bunches of texts are different studies that are just talking about this dispersal of Asian giant hornets here. The second link is all gonna be the stakeholder updates. And then the third link is how to sign up to receive them automatically if you would like. With Thank that being said, I am those. getting hungry for dinner. So do you all have any final questions for me? And I'll go ahead and put my email in the chat box as well. Thank you. Um, it's not exactly a question, but it might be helpful to, for us to get perspective if uh, the dots on the map were different colors for different calendar years. So we could see, get an idea of how they, they might be spreading out because if they're all the same color, we can't tell very much. Yeah, um, you can go online too and see that. So everything just comes off this, basically this link, agr.wa.gov slash hornets. It's just, I mean, it's a state webpage, so it just isn't the easiest to navigate because once you click on a link, you have to use the different back. It's, it's a state website, right? Um, so here is the last billions of links I'll post in the chat box for you, but this is a link to data this year. Um, and hopefully, we can eventually get that good enough to show you the data um, from multiple years, but it's still always in, it's still all been in that one county of Washington state up in that Northwest corner. Okay, and my last question is how many employees of the state of Washington are on this case? Oh, I think it's about five. So me, Chris, Sven, Ryan, Nathan. So there's about, five of us um, that are kind of like year round employees. We don't dedicate, um, I would say all of our time because we have like other projects that go on, but Asian giant hornet definitely trumps number one. It's my 90% of my job. Um, and then during the on season when the hornets are active and when we're trapping. So basically May to December um, is kind of when we have trappers. It's, which is another, I think there's six or seven of them. Um, so they're, like seasonal employees that just run the, the Hornet traps. All right. Well, thank you very much. If that's the last of the questions, uh, we appreciate very much your uh, taking your evening uh, and giving it to us and uh, good luck. Yeah. Yes. Well, thank you all and have a great evening. And I hope your bees are happy and ready for winter.